This is the third in our series of lectures on other forms of induction. In this lecture, we're going to give an example of a proof using the principle of complete induction. We're going to use it to introduce the set of Fibonacci numbers. So here we give the inductive definition of the sequence of Fibonacci numbers. We define f sub 1 to be 1, f sub 2 to be 1, and for any natural number n bigger than or equal to 1, we define f sub n plus 2 to be f sub n plus 1 plus f sub n. So what we're doing is we're saying that if we know any two Fibonacci numbers, any two consecutive Fibonacci numbers, then the next one in the sequence is obtained by adding together the two predecessors of it. So here are a few terms of the sequence. We begin with f1 is 1, f2 is 1, then we get f3 by adding the previous two, we get f4 by adding those two, we get f5 by adding these two, we get f6 by adding these two, etc. The exercise is to prove that f sub n is defined for every natural number n. This is similar to an exercise we considered earlier where we defined inductively the factorial function, um, the summation function, and the product function, and we used principle of mathematical induction to show that they were defined for all natural numbers. We can't do that here because it's not the case that each term of the Fibonacci sequence is defined by its immediate predecessor, but rather by a few of its predecessors. So what we do is we define the set S to be the set of all natural numbers such that F sub n is defined, and we apply the principle of complete induction to prove that S is equal to all of the natural numbers. So here I'm just reminding you what is the formal definition, what is the inductive definition of the Fibonacci numbers. And here's the beginning of the proof. We begin by telling the reader what is the set S. S is the set of all natural numbers such that F sub n is defined. And we warn the reader that we're going to use the principle of complete induction in order to prove that S is equal to all of n. Now the basis step is concerned with proving that some of the smaller values of n lie in set S, and we're, we're only going to do the ones for which it's absolutely necessary. Um, and for this one, since F1 and F2 are defined uh, in a separate way from the way the subsequent terms are defined, we're going to have to include F1 and F2 um, in our proof of the basis step. So I just indicate since f1 and f2 are both defined to be 1, it follows that 1 and 2 are elements of s. Remember, it's the indices that are the elements of s. So the indices for f1 and f2 are 1 and 2. Now we pass to the inductive step. So the first thing we do is we give ourselves a natural number, little n. Now remember what I warned you about in the previous video. When you're writing a proof using this PCI, you should always indicate what is the smallest value of n for which you have not yet verified that it lies in the set S. So since we've already verified that 1 and 2 are elements of S, we're assuming that n is bigger than or equal to 3, and this is standard here. We assume that all of the predecessors of n lie in S. So we have to now prove that n is an element of S. So since n is bigger than or equal to 3, it follows that these two are both natural numbers, right? Because 3 minus 2 and 3 minus 1 are both natural numbers. And if n is bigger than 3, then that's even easier to, to notice. And they're both assumed to lie in S, right? That's the assumption here. So therefore, by definition, we know that F sub n is defined to be the sum of the previous two. And since each of these is defined, it follows that F sub n is defined as well. Thus, n is an element of S.
because f sub n is defined. And so now we have the right to say that by the principle of complete induction, it follows that s is equal to n.